Hello, my juicy co-creators. Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour. Today, I'm in studio. It's a little bit different. The weather condition, we're not exactly the ones to do to do this interview outside. But boy, let me tell you, we're here in Boulder, Colorado. I'm sitting next to hot Robert Ohato. <laughs> Isn't he hot or what? I mean, come on. This is insane. And we're going to speak. This is not just a hot body next to me. It's actually... A, a really deep, beautiful, spirited human being with a beautiful heart. So I'm excited to, if you don't know Robert, to to meet him here and to get to know him and to really use those tools that we're going to talk because this is exactly, we're in a, are we in a paradigm shift or are we already in this new kind of world? Just, just in a second, because I haven't introduced you, but you're this intuitive life strategist. You, you are the author of Transforming Faith into Destiny. He studied with Carolyn May Miss that I've interviewed Mace, actually. We say Mace, Mace. but it's spelled M-Y-S-S. -S. Right. So you know her. I do know Carolyn. We uh, taught together at her institute for a few years, and you know, we, uh, I think she's amazing. And she uh, was a great mentor as an intuitive for me and got me on my own path and stuff. So yeah, yeah. What a warrior. I mean, there are some true warriors, you know, and some amazing teachers here. And, and, and it's true there is, I see it as I travel around the world, that there's this myth of integrity. And sometimes some people you know, hide behind spirituality when really it's the same old way of doing things. And it saddens me profoundly. And I know the, uh, I'm not going to say this new generation because there's some people in their 60s and 70s that have got that too. But it's really time to do a little bit of a cleanup and, and to really uh, be ourselves. We're going to speak of the shadow uh, work. Is that how you say it? The shadow work. Yeah, and. Shadow work. Being intuitive and, and, and the soul esteem, all of those are things that are really important to talk about, but mainly to feel. I want you to feel in your body what it feels like, what we're going to speak of. And if it resonates with you, then apply those tools. You know, this is part of, of, of this shift. So thank you, Robert, for being available. I mean, we were in contact years ago, weren't we? And, and Yeah, yeah. And, and then we've just synchronicity and here we are years later. Yeah. It's fantastic. In your hometown. In my hometown of Boulder, Colorado. Uh -huh. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robert, um, there is, there is. let's get straight into it, because there is this part um, of ourselves that have been deeply hurt in our childhood. We went through some tough uh, times, all of us, I think, no? Yeah. And, and it's, there's an opportunity there, isn't there? Yeah, I think what's happening in spirituality and self-help right now is this you know, this, this shift in the field that's necessary for us to take an inventory of our own shadow in this field so that we can go to the next level of healing and being alive and being present to our lives and connecting with each other. I think after all the readings I've done on people and one of the things I read is their soul contracts, these agreements we make before we're born, uh, I've really come to understand that the main thing we're really doing here is trying to connect. You know, it's about connection. And what is therefore the thing that blocks us from those connections with each other and most notably ourselves? And reading the psyches of people, tracking into their psychology, their psychospirituality, and their soul blueprint, which is this uh, agreement we all have made on this sort of blueprint of fate and destiny we've made this agreement with before we come here. There's this common denominator that I'm really, really... Um, feeling an urgency to speak of, and that's shame. And it's the thing that we, we, we don't even realize is in us, informing our self-concept, even how we perceive spiritual principles. It's informing how we see our lives as souls and our spiritual journey. And we have no clue because it's so natural to us in the human journey to be shame-based creatures in a shame-based culture. So I think a lot of the awakening that I'm seeing that I've really made the leading thing in my work at this point is how can we you know, heal the shame and move into a deeper place in our field. Also take some accountability for you know, some of the teachings that are actually shame-based and we had no clue. So that's where I'm finding my passion these days in terms of reading people, helping people, and what I teach and what I want to talk about. It's about cultivating just a organic, innate sense of okayness. Yeah. And, and, and being okay with those aspects of ourselves that we've been kind of trying to hide and things. Yeah. Huh? Because otherwise people can feel it. I mean, we, I feel we're becoming more and more sensitive. You're an intuitive, but we're all, aren't we? Yeah, we're all intuitive. And I think the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, what we're masters at is blocking it. You know, we learn how not to actually listen because of shame, you know, because intuition is going to ask for you to expose uh, your destiny asks of you to expose the most vulnerable and also um, gift filled parts of yourself. And to bring that forward, you know, you have to be willing to be 
to, to be judged or to be different or to stand out, you know, and as much as people are, you know, aspiring to stand out, there's another part of us that goes, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm going to dim down, man. I'm not, I'm not going to shine that bright because then I'll illuminate other shadows and I will then, you know, take a hit for that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be different. Are you crazy? Yeah. You know, and then we, 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 we suffer, we, we pull in, we retreat and we really aren't, uh, we're always living purpose, but we're not living destiny. And destiny to me is this sense of really maxing out your purpose with the most uh, powerful, compassionate, heart-filled light you can. And coming from that core sense of, this is what I was born to do, man. It's on, you know, yeah. bringing it forward. But I, I love when you when you connect shameness or the shame with our life purpose, because it makes perfect sense to me that where we hurt it the most, there is healing to be made, but also there is great soul connection there and maybe even contract. Tell us what kind of shame you had to go through. What does it look like for us? Is it like a, a big come out for all of us, basically? <laughs> well, it's funny you use those words because... For me, you know, understanding shame was something I met when I was born as a gay man. So growing up gay and knowing that I wasn't accepted and that was wrong in the eyes of religion and in the eyes of culture, you know, I always felt very much on guard and very sensitive to tracking shame. So it makes sense as I moved into my intuitive abilities and began to read people over, the t over time, I realized I'm a shame tracker. I'm reading the shame factor in people. I'm starting to look into the psyche. Where is the shame? Where is the shame? And then the thing about being intuitive and, and seeing things symbolically and understanding the energetic and technical aspects of what's going on is I'm looking at how that informs choice, esteem, you know, how we even interpret spiritual principles. Let me give you an example. Karma. We have a shame-based punitive, punitive idea of karma. We think that karma is something that we, we must work off, burn off because we're wrong. There's something bad with us. We've got to keep reincarnating to fix it. That's shame. What if you saw karma as just, in this life, simple choice consequence, it's a cos cosmic law, but it has nothing to do with worthiness, it has nothing to do with, are you okay? You're always okay. But we identify, and we're taught to identify in this culture, because we come from this understanding of God being this wrathful, damning force, right, that's going to send us to heaven or hell if we're not, you know, doing what we should. And we were also, by the way, born with original sin, which is like saying original shame. So what happens if you take that out of you know, the, the picture and just be, and just be. And then I think it changes the game in spirituality and self-help. Even if you're not praying to some Catholic Christian God, you're still praying to the same kind of shaming, damning, wrathful thing if it's a law of attraction God. You know, it says, well, you got to think positive only. Otherwise, you know what? You're going to attract to yourself, doom and gloom. That's shame. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's the same uh, voice. Or, or, you know, you got to get rid of your ego. Otherwise, you won't get enlightened. Shame. You know, you are okay now. Let everything from here be about okayness and the revelation and revealing and pulling off the layers to, to let you shine, you know, and we, we, we just dim ourselves down. And that's why we block intuition. We, we don't want to listen to intuition because intuition is always going to guide you to shine. Yeah. Always. It's going to say shine. So there is the shadow work that you call that those those blockages and this thing that we have to 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 go through though. So it's so it's it's pretty it's pretty tough, huh? Uh, it's it is is it so there is healing to be made for our soul to fully shine, right? Yeah, and the healing to me is about inclusivity. So I think a lot of times we think of healing as getting rid of something. So I'm going to get rid of my cancer. I'm going to get rid of, and certainly you know if you have something like that with your body, I think that language might apply. But I think when you come when it comes to the psyche and psycho spiritual healing, it's about I'm going to include all of me, even my rogue wounded child, my addict, my you know perfectionist, my uh, critic, inner critic. I've got to give those parts of me love because they're breathing fire because they got rejected because they were shamed because they weren't allowed to be included because they were made wrong. So the idea is, you know, we think in terms of slaying dragons in ourselves with the sword. I'm getting closer. Okay, okay. <laughs> we think of, of slaying dragons with the sword when really they need a hug. You know, you, you actually, the dragon stops breathing fire in you, the part of you that self-sabotages you, the part of you that you reject when you hug it in. So healing to me is about including more, you know, bringing more into the fold. Mm -hmm. I think of it as having a committee of self. So what committee members won't you allow in the room? Most of us would be like, my codependent, you're not coming in here. My addict, get out of here. You know, um, the part of me that can't do everything perfectly, you're not coming in either. My wounded, abort, abandoned orphan child, do not sit down. You know, I did a reading on someone recently, and, and uh, you know, they were saying in the reading, you know, and I was reading them, I thought, oh, boy, you are doing a number on your inner child. Well, I talk to my inner child. 
And I'm like, yeah, you do, with a lot of judgment. You know, and we do that all the time, and that's why I think now we have to be very, very mindful in this field of when we are subscribing, believing, or reading books and teachings that reinforce the shame. If you're reading a book that tells you there's something wrong with your soul, and that's why you're incarnate, and that's why you're here, and that, and you got to burn off karma, and you got to fix it, shame. Straight up. It costs you $5,000 to make the karma cleansing. Right. Yeah. Burn a bunch of candles around you. Clear, clear the bad juju. Shame. You know, so, and similarly, if you're reading a book that says, get rid of the ego, it's the worst thing that ever happened to you. You're never going to get to enlightenment without it, with an ego. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, as someone who's read the human psyche for over a decade as a job, you need an ego. You need, a, that is part of being a human being. I'm Robert Ohado. You're Lilou Massé. And oui, monsieur. Oui. Parce qu'il parle français. Uh, plus tard, on va parler français. Hein? Yeah. Uh, Later on, we're doing a French. Uh, we're gonna try. I'm gonna try. Um, but the thing is, is you need you actually need an ego. It's just a matter of not mistaking it for the center of your power of your or of your consciousness and loving the the, the wounded parts of it is so essential. And you can't love something you're rejecting and trying to get rid of. So I think we have to slow down and really check it before we wreck it in this field. There's so much going on right now where people are like get rid of the ego. I don't have an ego. Look at look at me. I don't have an ego. Only the ego can say it doesn't have one. Only the ego is going to be the one. Saying, Good point. Uh, I don't have an ego and, and is interested in getting rid of itself from its wounded shame. So Brene Brown opened the door, I think, for a conversation on shame that was wonderful. She's one of my, you know, my favorite peeps out there right now. But we need to keep continuing this conversation into our own shadow, into the shadow of spirituality, self-help and awakening, because it is rampant and it is deadly and it is keeping us from just being okay and being here. Destiny is full presence in the moment unconditionally. That's where the magic's going to happen. That's where the doors are going to open. That's where you're going to get nourished and loved and connected, yeah. you know? So there is the shadow work that we have to personally do, but the, you're, you're really talking the big picture here also. What is our role? Because we feel it's so big. What role can we play really in that? I think, you know, the, 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 the macro and the micro levels of ourselves, you know, the, the me and my life and my personal sense of my journey and then the bigger world picture, they're all connected. You know, and that's so good to locate yourself in that because when I when I read people, um, I, I and this is just true in psychotherapy. There's been a lot of talk about family wounds, you know, and our origin and our wounded origins, but we haven't talked about how culture wounds us, how our culture inflicts wounding. I know that as a gay man, I was wounded out of the womb. You know, I I mean, right up your right away, I was set up to have to negotiate shame, cultural wounding, not being okay, right out of the womb. So that informed me as an intuitive, as I grew into my intuitive abilities, I was always questioning culture, you know, and I don't, I think that's the next frontier. Because if we talk about mysticism being this pursuit of the soul, if you will, or this embodying or uh, soul identity harnessing, or, you know, the things that you hear all the time, what does that really mean? Hmm. If your soul is a celestial being, not a cultural being, then to come to know that essence of self, you must let go of cultural filters, including shame. That is a cultural energy bound to earth school, bound to the living energy pattern of this planet. And it's not going anywhere in our lifetime. It's always going to be around. So how do we work with it, make it conscious, love ourselves in compassion to it? Because you can't judge your shadow. The more you judge your shadow or the shame, the more that it gets fiery. And it's just this paradox. You just kind of keep going crazy trying to get rid of shame in the shadow. And, you know, I, I watch people all the time think, I'll say, you know, let's heal your shame. They think, get rid of it. No, no, no. Love it. Because that's the only way it's going to just kind of surrender itself, the treasures behind it, and then you move into what? Conscious choice. Is, is it a matter also of, of seeing that part of ourselves like a little child that is super scared and we have to kind of take care of, like it has not really grown up, like it got stuck in that moment? Yeah, one, one of the great ways to think about it is, you know, uh, in a grounded way is think about how you talk to your inner child. Would you talk to any other kid that you would encounter that way? No, I mean, you would not be that brutal. You would not be that mean to some other child in front of you, I would think. You know, most of us, we wouldn't. And how would you like to parent yourself? What does that mean? Well, stop beating the crap out of your child inside. You know, stop telling it it's wrong. And, oh, I didn't, I didn't uh, manifest this on my vision board. I must have done something wrong. I'm wrong. I must not think positive enough. What's wrong with me? I counterintend. I can't get it together. I can't make it happen. I'm going to miss destiny. Let me tell you something. Destiny's not that fragile. 
it is not that fragile. There are greater forces watching out for you. You have a guidance squad around you, making sure that you are on point and you're protected. And they have to negotiate your shame to speak. When you're trying to get intuitive information, check in with your shame first. Mm. Go, wait a minute. How would I perceive or interpret the data that I might get from my guidance squad, but through shame first? So let me check in. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, mm-hmm. you know, bring it. What, what does that look like? It looks like, oh, I'm, uh, I've got to get fixed. I got to fix this. I got to get rid of this pattern. Uh, shame, shame, shame. And your guidance squad's going, oh man, we can't get through to you. Mm-hmm. you know, we cannot get purely directly through to you because your psychic filter of shame at the cultural and to the personal level, it's going to distort everything. We, we could tell you, you are, and I call it flossom, being awesome and full of flaws at the same time, being equals flossom. Embrace the flossomeness, you know, ventilate yourself and let yourself just be okay. Yeah. You know, instead of trying to figure out how to be perfect, how to make things happen, how to manifest, you know, I don't know, does, do, do you want life to happen to you or are you going to happen to life? Together. Yeah, together, in connection. We need each other, you know. I mean, I think everyone thinks they have to do it on their own and, and, and admitting and being vulnerable and always open and curious about yourself and about, you know, all the parts of you. All, everybody in you deserves a seat on your committee. You don't want necessarily them to hijack the committee and make all the choices. I don't necessarily want my, you know, addict, rogue, or, or my child making choices at the committee, but I want to hear from them, you know, because they're... It's openness. Yeah, it's the, I, hey, let's all, we're, all of me gets to be here, you know. Now, I think destiny happens when you can allow all of yourself to show up. You get nourished, you connect, you can touch, you can feel, you can receive, you can give, you know, when you're here. And you get guided exquisitely, intuitively, when you're here. So, so it's pretty easy in the end to find our life purpose. I think it's it's a matter of surrendering to it in, in a lot of ways. And there's a duality to it, because then there's also the active participation of working with obstacles, working with challenges, harnessing character, you know, building muscle. That sucks, man, going to the gym. But it, like spiritually speaking, spiritual boot camp, you know, you get it sometimes, but... Earth school, you call it. Earth school, earth school boot camp. But at the same time, I think we get in our head and we make it far, far more mentally complicated than it actually Mm. organically really is. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. We have to go a little bit and touch on soul contracts. And and actually, from what I hear in your your consultations or when you have somebody, you you look at the chart, the astrology chart, the birth chart. What what, what do you see there? Why is that important? Is that that the blueprint or what is it? Mm. Oh, I love this question. Um, I began studying astrology 20 years ago, and I've evolved it actually in a particular way. I call it soul contract astrology now, um, because what most people, when they think of astrology, they're actually referencing a medieval model of like the planets cause things to happen. And the real, realer truth to me is that those planets are in you, their forces in you. So when Mercury is retrograde in the sky, it's retrograde in you, you know, and it's about understanding the synchronicity they represent in terms of the cycles of energy that we live in. We all live in patterns. Before you and I were born, there were already patterns managing and creating reality here. We fuse into them on a soul level as part of the fate and destiny, right? So the birth chart is, I found to be the most astonishingly accurate tool when you see it from that place of blueprint, but it's a verb. You know, it, and it's, it's, the, it's the map, but it's not the country. Your soul is also part of this. So, because I, be, I could be looking at the birth chart, same birth chart of a dog or a human being, a five-year-old. How do I know the difference between that being a dog's birth chart or a human being's birth chart? It's the souls and the consciousness behind that architecture, that blueprint, that engages and animates through it. So it's, it's a tool. It's an intuitive tool. It's not everything. I don't think anything's ever, ever everything, but it is. That's in, another good point. Yeah. It, but it's insanely useful and yeah. brilliant. And everybody's got, I call it a soul schedule. Your, your development is scheduled. Uh, just like our biology has a schedule. You know? There's nothing for us to do really then. Well, there is. You know, you still have to uh, show up, uh, participate, engage, you know, meet challenges, I think, cultivate certain qualities. Um, but I think a lot of times that we try too hard in terms of purpose, in terms of, you know, and we could probably definitely chill out a bit, you know, like I can just chill out, you know, if it's meant to be, it's going to happen for me. Yeah. You know, you're not going to miss this. I'm showing up. I'm present. I'm, I'm engaging my heart. You know, this is where, this is where the, the compass will be. It's, we've gotten way too, uh, I think, mentally focused in terms of the mind's power. Wait, and to me, in terms of reading power in people and their, their psyche and their consciousness, the mind is actually the caboose. It's not the engine. We make it all about think good thoughts, manifest this and that. You know, like I, 
I, I always say, you know, you could be on an air, there's people flying in airplanes right now and they're thinking that the plane's going to crash or they're afraid it will. And they don't because our minds aren't that powerful. You know, I, my mind can't generate universes and generate, you know, the, the movement of the sun and the, uh, or the planets around the sun and the galaxy. I, 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 so, so our power, this is to say, where's the power? It's not ours, but yet we're part of it and we're, we're of it. So yeah, knowing your limits and knowing power and powerlessness in your life is so key. That's what lets you chill out. So you can put intention forward. You can do what you can, you know, from a place of sense, a, a sense of calling and One of the things that um, I define purpose through is two things. One is, you know, Andrew Harvey, my dear friend, he, um, he was on my radio show once and he said something so profound that it riveted me and I've never forgotten. I try to say it every time I get a chance. And he said, you know, if you want to know your purpose, look outside your window in the morning and ask yourself, what breaks your heart the most? Mm -hmm. And I think that that really locates you in something that you're here to help heal give love to, bring into the fold of being alive and connecting, you know. The other part of it, though, that's connected is what innate talents, gifts, and passions do you have that facilitate and help that healing? You know, so we all have, I think, things that break our hearts more. Like, for me, it's the bully, people being bullied. I can't stand it. I was bullied as a kid. I was the one on the playground standing up for people, even though I was going to get my ass kicked, you know. So when it comes to uh, people being um, shamed or uh, emasculated or uh, you know, hurt in some way, I'm the one that's going to, st- I will stand up and kick your ass, you know? And that's where my, I find my, I locate some of my heartbreak and that empowers me to also be an advocate in this field to tell the truth and not just say stuff that's going to sell a book and not just say stuff that's going to, uh, you know, keep people happy and, and only positive. We have to be holistic, you know, transformation is. And so you're, sooner or later, each of us ends up at the door of our own shadow. You know, and I think it's how you meet that threshold that that starts to determine the next level of potential opening for you. And we, you know, I call this the dark night of the ego. Yeah. Yeah. When your ego goes through this sense of crucifixion, because some pattern, some software you downloaded to survive childhood, isn't working anymore. You know. And it creates separation. That's the thing is because we, when we're wounded or when we're hurt, we separate ourselves. But so how, what, what, what should we do really? Is it, is it, is it that's where vulnerability, authenticity or coming out, as we said earlier, or, I mean, how do we? I think, I think it's about, um, yeah, it's about uh, knowing that it's okay to feel whatever you feel and that you're okay already. You know, starting from okayness is, oh, and, and acceptance. It's funny, like when, and I do this too still, I mean, we, we, you know, you have an issue come up, you get triggered and you don't take that first step of this is okay. This can be okay. Instead, it's like, how do I get rid of this feeling? I want to get out of this feeling. I want to get out of this state, you know, instead of just saying, you know, I'm just going to be okay with what is arriving in my direct experience of life. And I'm also going to be okay with my first genuine, authentic response to it. Cause sometimes, you know what, you're pissed off, you know, something happens and you know what, you're just pissed off, you know, and maybe if you sat, actually the French. Yeah, exactly. Ah. Precisément. And so if you have that and you let that be okay, then I think you, you do get guided to the next thing. Maybe that's going to guide you. If you stay with your anger for a while, you might get guided to a need to set a boundary that is essential for your next level of purpose to happen or destiny to engage. Maybe you get guided to uh, some trauma that you forgot that needs just some forgiveness and some healing. You know, you have to be with the feeling. Emotions are intuitive anchors. They bring you to source of trauma, feelings, you know, and what I see in this field is everybody, I don't know if they consciously try to do this, but they, they engage the bypass. So let me tap it away. Let me start tapping it out. You know, let me, yeah, I don't want to feel angry. So I'm not, you don't like EFT is not your, I think EFT is fantastic, but you first have to do the process of locating the source of the emotion. And then you can begin rewiring the the nervous system through EFT. I think it's an amazing, brilliant tool, but any of these tools out there, including astrology, including intuition, we can use them as bypasses. So there's a trap. Yeah. You have to be mindful of that. And then the question to live in is why would I want to bypass this right now? What, what am I avoiding? What am I not wanting to look at? I'm going to tell you, there's always going to be some orb of shame around that. Always. Because shame says there's something inherently defective and wrong with you. Mm. No matter what you do, that's the gig. Yeah. Oprah said it many times in all her interviews at the end after all the hundreds and thousands of interviews she's done is, 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 is that most people are just think they're not okay and not good enough. Yeah, so there's always that orb of it. So 
if I go near, and we were led to believe, this is how I know when I was, you know, um, punished as a child for doing something wrong, you know, you're, you're, you're told you're a bad boy. You are a bad boy. Instead of what you did wasn't so cool, Ohado, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. The behavior isn't identified. It's the person that's made wrong. And so we internalize that. That's how we operate in this culture. I guarantee you, I could pull out something that, that would be very triggering for people in terms of someone doing something, uh, an atrocity, a crime that would lead them to judge that person and their soul. I mean, I can do it. It's, you know, we all have, and I always say that's your limit of compassion. Yeah. And so it's good to watch that in yourself. When do you go to I'm wrong versus this isn't really good behavior <laughs> to be, you know, to be doing. And it's important, as you said, to, to take a step back then and to see what kind of soul contract could have happened or why this person, why, why is the role of this person, why, why, why am, am I having it? What's the opportunity? Yeah, what's the opportunity to heal, to, love, to bring more love to yourself right now? What's that opportunity right now? You know, how can you bring more love into your system? Instead of judgment, instead of fixing, instead of making something wrong, that always begins with acceptance. I'm just going to be okay with this. And I'll see where I go. I'll get curious about my anger. I'll get curious about my depression. I'll get curious about my desire to be, you know, codependently managing someone right now. I'm just going to hang out with her for a minute, you know, take five and then um, see what happens, you know. And then that gives you an opportunity to engage on a soul contract level whatever um, awakening or and also it engages synchronicity let me tell you that will engage synchronicity that will bring to you that pause of being with what is brings to you the teacher the the let's say medicine of the moment that you need but There's you a lot of trust and faith in it and tolerance you got to tolerate discomfort you know we all think we're entitled to comfortable lives and that destiny is comfortable tell that to martin luther king jr mm -hmm. tell that to jesus christ mm -hmm. was it comfortable for them hell no you know, they pay the ultimate price. You know what I'm saying? So we have to move. I mean, not that everybody has a destiny like that. You know, most of your listeners probably don't. But the, the reality is, they do. To, well, not to hang on a cross or be shot. <laughs> no, but they're ju we're we're on the. Let me tell you, aren't we my co-creators? I mean, we're on on a serious role here. I mean, we're up for transformation on the planet, transforming ourselves. Thank you for being there. You know, and and giving yeah. us those tools because. Let me tell you, I think there's no small or big role. You know, we're, we're really, it's, it's really massive, and this is what's really changing also. And to, know, to, know, to locate yourself in destiny, which I would define as your, the highest potential of your gifts to the world, it is always going to be in the unknown uh, and in the unknown of risk. You ha destiny is risk. You have to be willing to step into what you don't know, to bring your game, have character be built, have things, power and powers and gifts in yourself awaken you didn't even know were there. You know, it's not found in what you know. What's found in what you know is the arrows toward the unknown and how to best move toward the unknown. So growing up from, for me, you know, in a, in a very abusive alcoholic home and um, watching my father die from, essentially from alcoholism and suicide, you know, I, I realized and began to understand that those experiences were arrows you know, toward, I wouldn't be the compassionate person I am today without having had those experiences. I don't believe that's true. You know, so it's a matter of how do you find the silver lining in your fate the, and, and uh, you know, move through all that you need to with that from, you know, therapy to writing angry letters to beating pillows, all that good stuff, you know, and then forgiveness and then, and then, and then shame. You know, how do you start, how do you just keep continuing this journey of enriching yourself with more and more unconditional presence and love. I'll say that and people will be conditional in five minutes with presence with themselves. You know, I don't like this about myself. I don't want to, I don't want to sit with this part of myself, Robert, you know, and I'll tell you reading you as an intuitive. Now you've blocked intuition. Your guides have to work through those filters and blocks. How do we know it's really intuition. Yeah. Well, intuition is always operational, first of all. So it's, therefore it's always real. I think there's a difference between uh, getting guidance that is to unravel your block versus direct guidance for a destined step into potential. So let me give you an example. I can get guidance that says, you know what, if I'm an addict, uh, the guidance is always gonna be if you're an addict to heal your addiction first. You can't move anywhere else within an addiction. That pattern is all consuming, all your life force, all your focus, all your uh, compulsivity, and your choice is hijacked. You don't have any free will, really. You know, so all intuitive guidance for addicts is always gonna be to, to hit a bottom and get sober, until they do. And if you can extrapolate from that in your life and think, well, what in my life, you know, do I, uh, where am I just not willing to see something, tell the truth? Addicts are completely in denial most of the time. Not always. Sometimes they know they're full-blown going down, but sometimes they don't. 
Where in your life are you not telling the truth? Because your intuition first has to say, tell the truth. Or your intuition has to say, get out of your history, get into the present time. You know, so we time warp ourselves with our consciousness. You know, and we don't even, it's not that we consciously try to do this. I was teaching, a, let me give you an example, I was teaching an event in South Dakota and I have a beautiful black lab and I was coming around this corner with him on a hike and there was this group of women coming toward me and he's the kind that, you know, would lick you to death, loves you, loves everybody. He's like the social ambassador on every trail. You know, I think everyone in Boulder knows him by now. But he went up to this woman and she freaked out and she, I, I'll never forget this, I watched her almost shapeshift in front of me into this little scared girl. She put her hands like this and she was screaming and at first I thought she was kidding because I was like, yeah, he just wants to say hi. And then I realized I was witnessing her time warp back to some trauma with a dog at like, I, I was thinking intuitively around five or six years old and tears were coming down her face and what that taught me was we are all her. All it takes is something in your life to time warp you back to a, an experience of abandonment, trauma, abuse, and you're not in the moment anymore. In the moment was a loving black lab. In her moment was this traumatic reliving of an experience of, oh my God, this dog's gonna bite me and you know do something to me. And I thought to myself, wow, that is so true about our intuition as well. You know, Our intuition will always work to get us out of time warp into present time, because it first has to guide us out of the trauma of history where we've frozen into some kind of uh, psycho-spiritual and neurological state of response. And then, you know, once we kind of melt that out and move it forward and realize, wait a minute, this is a black lab that wants just me to pet it. Okay, cool, hi. You know, so you, therefore, you're not seeing what's real. You know, present time is where you're going to always get your guidance. Mm -hmm. If you're not in present time, your guidance is to get into present time. Mm -hmm. So if you can get yourself here, you know, and how do you do that? You just start with okayness. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm okay, mm -hmm. everything's fine, this is the moment. Hi. It's not fooling ourselves there. Yeah. And this moment sucks, actually, by the way. But hey, that's more real. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. It's this this moment totally blows, but I'm here for it. You know. And if you can do that, man, that's where you're going. The magic, because that's where you get guided. You get okay. This moment, this moment might not be very fun. Destiny does not mean you are opted out of loss, grief, challenge. We have this notion that you know, or being intuitive doesn't mean that either. You know, it just means you're present for it and you can then engage what conscious choice in it that's destiny you're not going to get opted out of you know the pain and suffering of life with vision boards yeah, and magic enlightenment forever and all floating no 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 it doesn't work that way buddha died you know christ died we're gonna die you know it's it's just the nature of the gig here but if you can accept that and stop fighting it well then guess what you get guided to other things like okay while i'm alive this is what i can do Instead of, I wish I could find a way to stop feeling pain. I wish I could find a way to not, you know, ever be hurt again or abandoned. You know, anyone and everything at any moment can abandon you. That's just... And that's for a kid, actually. A kid, we can be abandoned, but not as an adult, right? Well, the thing that's interesting as an intuitive that I've seen is that um, when, and we're masters at this, because this is how people develop an esteem system, we... Our first primary esteem is just to survive and be um, wanted or taken care of by our parents. So we will do, we instinctively anticipate and read intuitively as kids what we have to to ensure that our parents feed us, clothe us, hopefully give us a hug at night, you know, take care of us, take us to school. So we're tracking the value system of the family and what that will, what we need to be or, or do to make sure that we live, survive. That's Ego esteem level one, right? So then out of that adaptation, we come up with a lot of creative ways to, to so I, people, this sounds so weird, but it's true. People will become scapegoats. Let me take on your crap. Let me be the black sheep. Let me be the person that takes, this is part of the adult child archetype. Let me be the person that takes on all the pain and deals with everything. And that's how I'll be needed. So, you know, they grow up and we, what do we do? We transplant that into our relationships. We replicate it all over again because that's how we got esteem as a kid. I got esteem as a kid by being the rescuer, the adult child, and the scapegoat, absorbing the shadow of everyone else. Everything that they didn't emotionally want to deal with, I took in, I dealt with, and now guess what? That's how I get esteem. So you go into adult life and you start doing it. After a while, it starts to get toxic. And then you end up talking to someone like me. It's like, you know what you're doing? This is, you have got this esteem system going on, man. And if you want to shift, you're going to have to also shift your esteem system. Mm -hmm. It's got to, your esteem has to come from something else. Yeah. So there's so many levels to uh, how we engage destiny and what will help it thrive. 
But presence, I think, at the end of the day is so crucial. And compassion is what allows for presence. Acceptance allows for presence. Gratitude. Gratitude. Okayness. You know, okayness. Just, it seems so simple and it's so hard, right? It's hard for me. I, mean, I don't have it down yet. Authenticity. Tell us about authenticity. Why is it so precious? What is it exactly? How can we be that? I think authenticity, um, which comes from the, the Greek word authentikos, It means to uh, be your own authority. In other words, it's sort of like Nothi Sotan, the know thyself on the Temple of Delphi. It's, it's knowing who you are and knowing uh, that in, in a holistic and uh, complete way, which means, hey, I'm not perfect, never going to be. Um, I've got my flaws. I'm flossom. And I've also got this brilliant grace and light as well, you know, and I've also got a shadow over here and I've got everything, all this rainbow of color in between and it's all me. So authenticity, I think, is the capacity to land in yourself unconditionally, but also know from that your limits. Um, we all have them. You know, we're not, we can't be everything to everybody. We have limits. And when you start to just surrender to that, then you can just be your, it's just being you, you know, I'm just going to be me, you know, and I'll tell you something, and this has been true for my life, because I didn't plan this career. I had a whole different agenda of being an actor and all this other stuff when I first, you know, was in my 20s in college. And, um, and then I was using metaphysics and spirituality and psychotherapy and study of psychology as a way to kind of heal a lot of my wounding from my you know, rough childhood. And I got tricked into this career by the gods. That's how I, how I feel about it. It's like, you know, this wasn't what I had consciously set my arrow toward, but yet it is where I'm, my brilliance came. You know, and, and it just arrived and people kept saying, my gosh, you're so good at this. You know, you have the skill, you can read people, you can tap in and in five minutes you figure them out before a psychotherapist takes two years, you know. So I, I learned that destiny, it's, it's something sometimes that you don't ever conjure with your mind. And that's why I'm, I'm saying, you get it. You it. You can't. It comes from here and it comes from, it does come from your heartbreak, you know, in, in part. It comes from your talents. It comes from um, the things you love. And don't supersize that. So don't shut yourself down because you think, well, I love to sing, but I can't be Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. So what? You're, be you. Maybe you're just going to sing in the church choir. Maybe you're just going to sing locally at the pub. But you're going to be but super happy because you're singing. You're nourished by being you. Yeah. If you're not yourself in what you do, you can't be nourished by it because it's an artifice that's standing between you and the connection of the result and, and how you're awakening people. You won't get nourished by not. So, you know, it's always about checking in, like, what's really real? What, and let's, practically, every day, as you have your experiences in the moment, ask yourself, what's my real, genuine, authentic feeling about what's happening right now? And sometimes we're like, oh, this really is kind of, Ugh. but I'm, that's not spiritual to be, you know, judge, judging it. You're not judging it. You're just telling yourself the truth. I don't like it. You don't have to like everybody. You don't have to like everything. You know, there's going to be things that happen on any given day where you just feel like, no, I'm, I'm feeling a no around this, man. I'm, I got to get out of here. And that's, that's a no that is, that is powerful. Genuine. That's love. Yeah. It's genuine. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you're not going to like everybody. Not everybody's going to like you. And that's okay. You know, if someone doesn't like me, which I can't imagine why they wouldn't, but, um, you know, I just, you know, it's a, the question, look, I know you don't like me. Can that be okay? Or my style of teaching, can that be okay? You know, with you, because it's okay with me. I'm okay with that, you know? Yeah. And so I always think of that, like giving other people permission to have their own authentic experience and, and get curious about it. Sometimes we get triggered into shadow stuff and, but, you know. And judgment, because we're afraid of, of judgment of others. And sometimes we dare, especially right now where we, where there's all those opportunities to pioneer new things, to be, to change career, to really do something, maybe about the, for the planet, maybe yeah. for others, what, what have you. Yeah, to step out of what, your family or culture tribally said would be the, your limits or, or what should be your lane. I've done tons of readings on people that became doctors because their fathers were, or lawyers because their fathers were, or to prove, prove themselves to their fathers or their mothers. And then realize after they did that, that that wasn't what they even wanted to do. You know, and then they feel lost. It's like, well, you weren't coming from here. Maybe you're a poet. Maybe you're, it's like someone who grows up in a military family and their father expects them to become you know, some, someone in the military, but they're a poet. They're a dancer. They're an artist. You know, they're an actor and they have to at some point come out just like I had to, like we all do in our own way. It's an archetypal process. Like I have to really tell you, I don't want to be a drill sergeant. I don't want to stand on the front line and hold guns. I don't want to be a Marine. I don't want, you know, I feel a pull this way. I want to be a veterinarian. I want, you know. 
And that's where we meet with destiny in those moments? Because the soul contract level of it is to serve the awakening of everybody, and awakening will always center here. Mm. We think it's all about awakening your mind and expanding the mind. Mm. That's the safe awakening. This is the real one. This is the one that has the risk. This is the one that makes you really give a crap. You know, when your heart comes online, think about it. That's when you care. That's when you feel like, I don't care what the consequence is. I have to do this. This is the choice that's true for me. I don't, you know, I have to come from here. If I'd stayed in my head, I would have never come out as a gay man. I'd have been like, oh, I can't do that. But it's done spun up in here in the shame, wounds, and beliefs, and never, ever landed here and said, you know what? It's in my nature, in my eros to love the same sex, to want to connect that way, you know? It's just my nature. By the way, this man is single. I'm just saying it like that. <laughs> Sometimes this happens. I just throw the little curveball. He was not expecting this, but here we are. Thank you very much, Lilo. I love it. Oh my God, I'm a matchmaker. I'm an interviewer slash matchmaker. They don't really know that. This is... <laughs> yes, I am single. <laughs> ah, this is good. I feel, I feel like I've done something. <laughs> Well, I'll keep you posted. <laughs> you may receive emails from all around the world because this is... But okay. en français... Oui, en français aussi. Hein? Oui. Robert, it's been uh, a delight to spend this moment with you. There's so much to talk about. I know we're going to meet again and, and do many things together. Um, we, we waited way too long for, the, for this one. No, but if it's perfect timing. Yes. Perfect timing. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're okay with this. We're okay with this. Yes. yes. Totally okay. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you so much. So if people... If those co-creators and us, we want to hear more about you. There's, there's your book, Transforming Faith into Destiny, and you do consultation. You have a radio show. You're yeah. basically everywhere. I have a, a very popular radio show, uh, Soul Connections Radio. I usually do it twice a week, at least once a week. There's uh, free uh, downloads for that on iTunes they can check out. Um, yeah. You're on YouTube. I'm on YouTube. Uh, I got some stuff there. I'm, uh, do, I do a newsletter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking it. I'm bringing it. And more and more all the time, more YouTube, more stuff like that too in the future. Yeah. You're watching what you're up to. Oh yeah, I'll be watching you. Ah. I'll be watching. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> now it's time to do the interview in French, my delicious co-creators. If you speak French, by the way, or you want to improve your French, la télé de lilou.com. For the ones that understand that one, they'll be able to understand those interviews that are just in French. But I'll make sure we translate this one in French and other languages because this would be too selfish to not share it wildly. Over the internet, if you love this video, please share it. Like it. Woo! I love it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> big, big kisses. Much love, my delicious co-creators. Have a beautiful, amazing day. Wow. <laughs>